You ready to do this, Peter? I'm ready, Spence. Punch it, Chewie. Welcome, super friends, to the Fortress of Nerditude podcast, a safe place to talk about all things in nerd and pop culture. I'm Spencer Stapleton, and my co-pilot tonight is Peter Christensen. Howdy ho, neighbor. We're two nerds that just refuse to grow up. Thank you for joining us. This is episode number 70. We release every Thursday morning on iTunes, Google Music, Spotify, YouTube, Stitcher, and everywhere podcasts are available. If you like what you're hearing, hit that subscribe button and get us automatically each and every week in your ear holes. Oh, not the ear holes. Peter, welcome back to the podcast. It's episode number 70. I looked it up. The last time you were uh, on the Fortress of Nerditude was episode 18 when we did a movie club on Doctor Strange. It's been a while. How are you? I'm doing really well. I actually watched Doctor Strange this weekend and it holds up. Still trippy, still fun, still Fortress of Nerditude worthy. Nice, nice. So what's what's new? What's going on in your life? Last time we talked, you were up in Seattle. You were working for the Big A. Mm-hmm. You still working for the Big A up there? Still work at Amazon, uh, working on something that it has not been released yet, but will be really fun when it is, and then I can talk about it more. Secret projects. I like it. Yep. And so, uh, I've got... Uh, are you using, like, vibranium for what you're... I mean, can you tell us anything? Is it is it something in Wakanda, like, that, that's being imported? I mean, what what's going on? I mean, if I was using vibranium, I would not be at liberty to discuss it. Dang. One way or another. Nothing. Okay. So, so tell us what's going on with the family. You know, in your personal life, what's new? Yeah. So we got uh, real busy. My oldest is in middle school, doing uh, advanced algebra and starting to do the young women's activities at church. Getting ready for camp this summer. Uh, my second daughter's in fourth grade. She's Loving it. She's a ton of fun. Uh, my youngest is in kindergarten. He's a silly kid. He uh, just was sick this weekend, and we took his temperature. We have this ear thermometer, and he, for some reason, enjoys getting his temperature taken in his ear. And yesterday, he was he had a high temperature, and so he stayed home from school. And then this morning, he woke up, and he brought me the thermometer, to take his temperature and I took it and it was 98.4 and he said, no, make it higher. And I did the other ear and it was 98.5 <laughs> and he says, no, make it higher. And I said, oh, this kid is calling in sick to school. He's calling in sick to kindergarten. You man, you, you got to teach him that he's got to hold the thing like up next to a light bulb <laughs> for like a minute right before and then put it in his mouth or his ear. And they're like, look, dad. Nah, my kids are, my kids are devious enough that I don't need to show him any tricks. <laughs> right, you you don't need to cause problems, is what you're saying. Right, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm the defense here, not offense. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I would be a bad uncle because I mean, I guess I I am an uncle, but I mean, in that case, I would be the bad uncle. It's like, oh, let me you know, let me show you, lick your palms, make them clammy, you know, a little Ferris Bueller's it's juvenile, day off, right? But then so is high school. That's very very true. Very true. Love that movie. Love that movie. <laughs> Well, uh, that's good. Uh, so for my week, I'm, I'm just doing the, the same old stuff. It feels like, you know, I, I get up, I go to work, I come home from work, I get on the treadmill and do some exercising, uh, you know, just, you know, that day in kind of day out thing. However, this last week, just about a week ago, five days ago or so, I ordered something called a pit barrel cooker. It's like a 30 gallon drum. And it's got rebar, and you put charcoal briquettes in the bottom of it, and you hang meat on hooks vertically, and it's a smoker, and you smoke meat in this thing. And it arrived today, and I cannot wait to bust it out and hang some ribs and some chicken and some pork, and I've got, I just, I've got brisket that I'm ready to start smoking in this thing. Uh, it's a shame that it's like so late at night because I want to dig into this thing because I've just been craving good barbecue and and the thing was relatively inexpensive compared to like a Traeger, uh, which I've been looking at for years and just never pulled the trigger on. But it's like less than half the price. 
My boss got one. He showed it to me, got me on board. My boss has actually bought a second one so he can leave one at the office and then has one at home. I'm looking at a picture of them on the internet. They look glorious. Oh man, it is so good. We've we've had ribs before. We've he's done chicken. And it's interesting cuz you think, "Oh, well, you know, this isn't going to this isn't going to cook or whatever, but it just slow cooks and you can, you know, toss in, you know, some wood and you can smoke for hours and hours and hours in it. Uh, I think I may try to smoke a ham for Easter this weekend. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't cleared it with the wife and the, the brother and sister-in-law yet, but I'm going to find out because if they've already got a, a ham that's pre-cooked, I can't do it. But if they need it cooked, I think I've got something I'm going to try. I'd so. like to volunteer. Yeah, yeah, please, please, me over one, one, one. Yeah, so, so that's new. Uh, other than that, just it's been a lot of the same old, same old. Uh, you know, this week it's been a lot of fun. I got, I got to spend you know a little more time with the boys this weekend uh, than than usual. I just didn't have a lot going on, so we were home a lot and got to you know play and have fun. But other than that, man, just trying to keep on top of everything that's happening out there in the crazy galaxy with all the stuff that's we're gonna get into today. Oh, I, I think you would like this. Uh, I told my middle daughter that I was going to be a uh, guest host on the podcast tonight. She goes, which podcast? The Fortress of Nerditude. And she lights up and says, really? When I'm in math class, I will put up my textbook. I'll stand it up on the desk so that the other kids can't see my paper. And I call that my Fortress of Nerditude. So she's got her <laughs> own Fortress of Nerditude and... I request you not file any uh, trademark claims against her. She's just a kid. Nah, she's she's not worth much right now. But if she hits it big time with something with vibranium or something, you know, you bring her in on this secret project you got going on, uh, you know, we may have to ha- we may have to have a cease and desist letter, and we may have to talk. I can, I can tell which we'll movie see. you saw recently. <laughs> I've seen it again. I, I I did use Movie Pass, and I went back and I saw uh, Black Panther again to see if my my overall impression of the first time was accurate. Maybe if it was hype and I kind of came away thinking pretty much what I thought the first time when I watched it, a lot of good, a lot of things that I really liked, but there were some problems with pacing and some problems at the very end, uh, and the final fight scene that just kind of really pulled me out of it. Um, good movie overall. It's not my top MCU movie. Uh, we've been, Breed and I have been rewatching all the MCU movies, uh, trying to lead up to Infinity War, and we just got done watching Captain America: Winter Soldier. And hands down, for me, that's my that's my top MCU movie. I would say, as far as like best movie quality of movie, I think I agree about uh, Winter Soldier. Although it's hard to get over how fun like the first Iron Man and the first Avengers and Thor Ragnarok were. But yeah, Winter Soldier was amazing. Ah, love it. Love it. So yeah, we're going to go to Guardians of the Galaxy next. We're trying to watch them in order and just trying to time it so it all kind of works out so we can get right to Infinity War right about the time we're done catching up. So four four weeks and counting. Yeah, four weeks. We're getting close. Let's uh, let's jump into some Rebel Intelligence. What do you say, Peter? Let's do it. I always have to let you know Many Bothans died to bring us this information. Rest in peace, you Bothans. Okay, Peter, Rebel Intelligence, what do you have for me this week? All right, well, uh, in the ongoing debate to determine whether the Earth is flat or round... Uh, a self-declared flat earth researcher named Mad Mike Hughes built a rocket and shot himself 1,875 feet into the sky. Is there really a debate still going on? (laughs) I don't know if debate is the right word. There's maybe some, uh, spirited dissent. Ah, yeah. But, uh, so it's round. So let me ask you, uh, let me ask you a question. How, how far up did he get again? 1,875 feet or... Roughly the height of the antenna on the Sears Tower. Okay. Uh, and I'm glad you called it the Sears Tower, because we don't recognize any other names here in this house. That is true. Um, so, I've been to the top of the Sears Tower before. Mm-hmm. 
And I can't recall that I can see the curvature of the Earth from that height. So my question is, is this guy, this, you said Mad Mike, is he, is he trying to disprove the round Earth theory with this rocket? I think that was the intent of building this rocket, but it sounds like it mostly turned into trying to prove that he could build a rocket and not die. And ah. I will give him props for that because I would never get into a rocket that I built. <laughs> right. So props to his courage, uh, maybe not to his uh, research methodology. Be- right. Because for you know a couple hundred dollars, he could have bought a plane ticket and gone 15 times higher than his rocket went. And you can see the curvature of the Earth from an airplane. That's true, but I've heard some really weird stuff that people that believe in flat Earth, that they say that if you go into the planes, that there's something in the air that they put into it that like helps and like it brainwashes you so that you think you're seeing the curvature of the no, Earth no, no, out the, the window, but the, it's not really. The brainwashing is from the chemtrail gas coming out of the back of the plane. Oh, maybe that's what it is. I think it's the uh, the refraction of the glass windows that makes it look curved. It's not actually curved. Right, right. That that's that's kind of what I thought. You know, would be a more plausible uh, theory than like you know you watched a little video and you got brainwashed. Here, here's here's my question, and because I, I see this and I, I know people that you know on Facebook and whatnot that believe this. This seems to me like this is should be very provable by science. Um, I think it's great that this guy tried to build a rocket and wanted to get up to see if you know if he could get that high. I hope that he. I hope that he does something bigger, you know, next, you know, uh, I don't know, a, a big weather balloon or a, a larger rocket or whatever. Um, but I just think that there's there's a point when we have to say, listen, science is science and we can explain a lot in this world with science. And, you know, how do you ignore so much fact sitting in front of you? Well, first of all, you sound like a round earth shill. So better <laughs> check, your, check your round earth privilege there. Uh, <laughs> my round earth privilege. Awesome. <laughs> but, uh, I found that people who distrust the scientific method and, uh, government research and big companies and all that, they are still willing to use their iPhones and use the internet and all that stuff that science has given us. And something tells mm, me if YouTube yeah. demonetize these video channels, their fervency for rounder or for uh, flat earth would decrease really quickly. Mm, that could be so what happens that is they go be. on, they make these videos that are two, three, four, eight hours long with no interruptions, no rebuttals. And so if you don't, if you're not fact checking each thing as you go, they can paint a picture that kind of makes sense or at least is internally consistent. And YouTube, Part of their payouts is based on how many minutes people watched. And so people are watching these very long videos for millions of views for millions of hours. Uh, it adds up to some nice change. You know, I'm, I'm not opposed to people making money on YouTube, but I, I get what you're saying. Like, there may be less than stellar motives, maybe? You know, I, uh, if, if one of them turns off ads on their videos and still keeps producing them, then I'll be more convinced that they're a believer. Sure, I will not be sure, convinced sure. that the earth is flat though. <laughs> right. But convinced of their authenticity of their argument that they truly believe that that makes more sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm with you there. Uh, so let me ask you a question, Peter, big fad, what two summers ago coming up on two summers ago, Pokemon go. Did you or the, or your family ever get into the Pokemon go craze? Uh, my daughter got into it a little bit, but she didn't have her own transportation to get to where the good poke stops were. And so she got bored with catching the ones that would show up in our backyard. So it's not a big thing in our household. I, I didn't get into it right, right at first, but I got into it a little later because I was like, okay, let me check this out. And it was a fun game. It got me out walking around. I went and walked with the boys uh, what I did find though was my church building was a pokey stop. So every five minutes you can spin 
the little pokey stuff and collect more balls and, you know, potions or whatever. And so I found that about every five minutes during the three hour session of church, I would just open it up, flick it once, and then, you know, collect whatever and be done. And then I was also doing that on Tuesday nights because I, I teach uh, Boy Scouts and, and I found that I was really not paying attention to what was going on around me because I was, you know, hitting that pokey stop nonstop and loading up. Um, but it was a fun game. You know, I, I, I played it for a while. Here's the thing that really gets me. It's still going on. And Niantic, the company that, uh, produced the game has just come out with a new or ex- describing a new update that's coming that basically says that trainers are now going to start receiving research tasks where they can go and do like activities and challenges that can be completed in game for rewards. And some of the rewards will actually lead trainers to access unique storylines that could include discovering the mystery behind the mythical Pokemon Mew. So the whole thing was, you know, get out, walk around, go collect, you know, as many as you can, right? Got to catch them all. Mm-hmm. Now, now they're introducing storylines and tasks and in-game rewards for these tasks. Do you think that this is a logical step for that type of game? Because we've got some other AR games coming down the road. We talked about it, I think, last week that there's a Ghostbusters AR game coming. There's a Harry Potter AR game coming. There's a Jurassic Park AR game coming. Do you think storylines and missions and tasks is going to be the way these are going to go? Or do you think this is just something that Niantic is trying to do to keep their product alive and relevant? Uh, I think both of those. Uh, Pokemon Go was a huge, huge hit, but it was also a fad. And I think they knew, even in the excitement of it blowing up, that their sustainable audience was not going to be anywhere near that. And so once the novelty of it wore off, there were still going to be probably millions of players playing regularly. And if you have millions of faithful players that are really interested in what you're doing, you can do well by giving them more to do. Um, My son loves playing the Minion Rush game on his iPad. And there's not much to that game. There's three lanes to run down. You can jump over stuff. You can slide under stuff. You collect bananas. Uh, But a couple years ago, they made a change to it where instead of just playing, you played on levels and they gave you challenge like collect 500 bananas or run for two minutes and 30 seconds, and you would earn rewards for playing that way. And then you could unlock new levels and unlock new areas, and he has just infinite uh, desire to play this game to get to the next level, to, to earn the next thing, to unlock the next area. And I think that adding stories and new content and new things for active players is going to be good for Pokemon Go. Uh, I also think that knowing... I I don't think that game companies know exactly what uh, mainstream augmented reality games are going to be like five years from now. And so a lot of companies are going to try a lot of things. Some of it's going to work. Most of it's not. And we're going to see some duds. We're going to see some exciting things. But Pokemon Go has the biggest audience of any of them until somebody figures it out and gets the mainstream success. So let me ask you this. We we know of three big ones that have been announced, Ghostbusters, uh, Jurassic Park, and Harry Potter. Out of the three of those, which one do you think is going to be the biggest success? Oh, gosh, probably Harry Potter, because uh, people are still spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year marketing Harry Potter books, movies. There's four more fantastic beasts coming yeah, that, out. Um, there's that's my, that's my guess too, is Harry Potter. They, like there was the ghostbusters movie last year or a couple years ago that was divisive at best. Uh, <laughs> right. And there's probably not going to be more ghostbuster movies for a while. Uh, there's another Jurassic park movie coming out, but you can't imagine them coming out with more than one every two or three years. And it's just right. nothing compared to tens of millions of books a year, two theme parks, a whole string of movies in the can. Uh, Harry Potter's going to have the biggest push behind it. 
I'm with you. I think I think Harry Potter is going to be the one. Ghostbusters to me sounds really interesting. Once again, though, like my childhood was, you know, in the 80s. And so I love that idea. And I think it could be really fun. But I don't see unless something big happens in the kind of the Ghostbuster franchise coming up. I don't see how that gets that big of a push. Jurassic Park probably is going to be second place and Ghostbusters third uh, behind Harry Potter. That's just kind of my feeling on the issue. Which is a bummer because Ghostbusters is the one that is going to make the most sense walking around your normal life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because in theory, it would be easier to find a ghost floating around than a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah. And I mean, it's all it's all little silly. Ghostbusters but I mean, took place you know. in a modern American city, not a Scottish castle or a tropical island. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Uh, what else you got for me, Peter? Well, it's uh, speaking of vibranium. Uh, it's a big, big week for Black Panther as it passed. Uh, it passed the first Avenger movie to become the highest grossing superhero movie in U.S. history at $631 million. Wow, that's crazy. And it's uh, the third highest comic book movie worldwide uh, behind the two Avenger movies at $1.2 billion. So so it's now the highest grossing domestic superhero movie. Mm-hmm. As I recall, Avengers was sitting like in maybe third place overall because i think titanic and avatar still were ahead of that yeah and i think uh the jurassic world or whatever the last jurassic park movie was is up there as well so i I wonder where i wonder where that's all gonna shake out uh in the end it's really interesting to me kind of the whole like you know keeping track of what, you know, what's selling this, what's selling that, you know, like what's the biggest movie? Cause of course it's the highest grossing superhero movie domestically, So, but it's gotta be, you know, in the, in the top five. So for domestic box office, there's star Wars, the force awakens, avatar, Titanic, uh, Jurassic world, black Panther. Uh, it would not take much for black Panther to pass Jurassic world and Titanic, just 30 million more dollars. Uh, now these are not. Yeah, that should that should happen. These are not inflation adjusted, so clearly Titanic right. sold a lot more tickets at nineteen ninety six prices. So let me ask you this: without looking, do you know what the number one movie is if you include uh, adjustments for inflation? Isn't it like Gone with the Wind by an enormous margin? It's Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind was almost like I think I don't. It's like almost like two billion dollars. With inflation, yeah, it's it's like not even close. And then it's crazy, <laughs> isn't it? Like the Wizard of Oz, and then Star Wars, the original one. Yep, yep. And so it, it's just interesting because you know, especially if you go back to like Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind, people didn't have TVs in their homes, so like they would just go back to see the movie over and over and over again. Yeah, and they're not what they're not streaming movies. They're not even renting them from Blockbuster. They're not even watching them on TV. It's listen to the radio at home or go to the movie theater and see Gone with Wind again. Which, I mean, you know, uh, that makes a lot of sense. But I always find that interesting. I don't think that that will ever be topped uh, adjusting for inflation. Because, of course, you know, a movie from 1939 was probably like, what, 10 cents to go see a movie (laughs) back then? Well, and, and the entertainment landscape is so different. It's like... You look at the numbers of how many people watch the finale of MASH. It's like more than any Super Bowl for the last 20 years just because there were three channels versus 500 channels plus the internet, plus streaming, plus on demand, plus Facebook, plus everything else. It's, there's nothing is going to be, uh, it's going to take up the mind share that uh, things could take up when there were fewer options. I will, uh, I will say for Black Panther, when I was watching it, I said half jokingly, half serious that this movie might be the biggest like African American or black cultural thing since roots. And, uh, it sure seems like the money's there. Yeah. You know, I definitely think this is probably the best, uh, 
if you want if you want to call it African American film as far as like uh financial box office success uh easily um but then the nice thing i think about this uh is that it shows that we can we're in a we're in a day and age where we can have a diverse cast and a movie can be led and helmed by people of different backgrounds than what we've typically seen for the last 50 years or so shout out to the fast and, and furious it, franchise for their diversity as well really you got to go there you knew I, you know i was going to <laughs> I'm still waiting to I'm still waiting to sneak in, sneak in an Affleck too. Oh gosh! Shout out to Ben Affleck and Steve's love of him and his giant his um, giant Phoenix back tattoo. Yes, yes. Um, so here's something I found interesting that happened this week. Uh, Donald Glover, who is a I'm a big fan of everything Donald Glover does. Um, he was along with his brother was going to be writing and I think also uh, producing an animated Deadpool series for FX. And uh, we haven't heard a lot about it. And then this week it says that uh, Glover and his brother, Steven, uh, who are going to write it and co co uh, executive produce the show have exited the project. So realistically, I think the only thing we knew was that Steve, Steven Glover and Donald Glover were going to be uh, part of this. And now they're not. And so we don't have any more information on it. Here's my guess, though. Uh, Deadpool is a Marvel property, which is now owned by Disney because Fox kind of had the the rights, which is why it was going to be put on FX or FXX. Um, but now that Disney owns it, I don't know that we're going to get a lot of Deadpool stuff, to be perfectly honest. And this doesn't really surprise me because I can't see an animated Deadpool movie being played on Disney XD. <laughs> so it's it's sad that it's it's sad that it's probably going to go into limbo and probably going to die. That's my guess. But we do have a Deadpool two movie that's coming out here shortly, and we'll we'll have to kind of see what what the big D what Disney wants to wants to do with this property going forward because it's obviously a very edgy gritty uh raw property and that's typically not the way disney likes to uh, operate that is true but deadpool is one of the most successful superhero movies financially so money finds a way money does find a way yes dr ian malcolm (laughs) (laughs) I I don't know I don't know where Disney would put it, but it's too valuable, and I I'm sure that Deadpool two Deadpool two is going to outperform the first Deadpool movie. So we'll see. Yeah, it'll be interesting to find out what happens. So, did you ever watch the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle cartoon when you were a kid? The original one that started in 1986. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, man. Absolutely. I would wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, an hour before my mom, and watch the two episodes that were on in the morning, and I would eat my Pop-Tarts and watch my Ninja Turtles, and then I had the movies, I had a big bag full of toys. Ninja Turtles were my thing as a kid. Uh, I have not kept up with the various different cartoons that have come since then. I had no interest in seeing the Michael Bay mutant steroid turtles but no not at all there is an upcoming ninja turtles cartoon reboot on nickelodeon and it looks pretty darn good the artwork is it kind of reminds me of the teen titans go and a little bit of the old comic book style and there's just fast action very dynamic looking uh it looks really great i i saw i saw this preview What did you think of the way the turtles are actually drawn? I am okay with it because they're turtles. They're kind of weird looking, but they're mutant turtles. So how normal are they supposed to look? Sure. They don't look like the, the Jim Henson animatronic ones. And they don't look like the mutant linebacker ones from Michael Bay. Uh, I'm, I'm fine with them. I probably won't watch it just because I watch very few TV shows. I mostly watch movies but i'm uh curious to see how this turns out you know 
I'm all for Ninja Turtle stuff uh, in theory because I loved it as a kid. I, I'm just like you, Peter. I would get up Saturday mornings watching Ninja Turtles and then, you know, whatever else I was into at the time. Um, but it's uh, I loved the original series so much and the video games and then the movies that came out in the early 90s that were oh so bad if you try <laughs> to watch them now. Uh, I mean, come on. Vanilla Ice was heavily featured in the second one. Um, it's yeah. Without very Vanilla dated, Ice, but, we wouldn't have Ninja Rap. Yeah, go Ninja, go Ninja, go. Um, it's I, I looked at this and I I like the art style, but I just didn't care for the way the turtles were drawn as much. Like I think it'd be okay, and I think if I watched it, I'd probably get used to it. But I didn't, you know. Yeah, it just it didn't maybe hit me the way I would want it to. But I do like that kind of art style overall, like in general. So, I don't know. It's, I may try it out on my boys and see if they like it. Because if they like it, you know, then I, I could see myself kind of watching it with them. But if they don't care for it, eh, it might not be something I watch. Well, so much of it comes down to how they convey the personalities of the turtles. Right. If they're serious, or if they get, you know, if Michelangelo's not funny, or if Donatello is not an endearing goofy, then what's the point? Right, right. I mean, that that was the beauty of the original, is that all the turtles looked identical except for the color of their, you know, of their uh, headbands, basically, and then their weapons that they had. And so it was all personality and voice acting. Yep. And so if if this isn't strong in that, it might, you know, it might suffer some. It might hurt a little bit. Yeah, everybody had their but. turtle... That they could relate to. I was a Donatello. Uh, I was a Donatello as well. I love Donatello. Strange that the Fortress of Nerditude has Donatello's. Yeah. Well, I mean, that makes sense. I I always, I I could meet people that, like, my brother loved Raph. Uh, My brother loved Raph. And I met a lot of people that liked Mikey, you know, Michelangelo. I didn't meet a lot of people in my travels that loved Leonardo. Like, that was their turtle. I don't know why. I feel like uh, people that like Leonardo would go into Wall Street. That's the determining factor. Uh, I see here on your essay that you filled out that you were a big fan of Leonardo. We're going to put you right on Wall Street and you can ring the bell. No, they're uh, <laughs> they're confident. They expect other people to do what they say. They're not going to back down from any challenge. No, that makes that does make sense. It, it's just, I, I don't know if I've ever come across anyone. So if, if you are a super friend and you're out there and like Leo is your guy, you know, holler at me, you know, shout, shout at me and, you know, tell me why. You're clearly not supposed to say that you like Leonardo because he was the almost parental figure among them. You were supposed to say you were either a party dude like Raphael or, or like Michelangelo or a tough guy like Raphael. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so the last thing last thing I had, this is kind of interesting. Uh, Peter, I don't know if you and I have talked about this, but Suicide Squad, did you see that movie? I actually kind of liked it once you get over what a sloppy mess it is. What a dumpster fire of a movie it there, was. Like, any given five minutes of it was great, but the way they put it together was not great. And I, I did not grow up with DC characters besides Superman and Batman. And so the suicide suicide squad characters were all new to me and I wanted to hear more about all of them. Like I wanted to see a killer croc origin story and I wanted to see, uh, you know, a buddy cop thing between Harley Quinn and, and Deadshot. There was so much good there and the movie just, <sighs> yeah, that's about the best you can say. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's that's kind. I mean, that's kind of how I felt. I, I I've said it over and over and over again. The trailer for that thing was banging. It looked so good, and I went in with thinking that this was going to be a great movie or at least a good movie, and I came away going, "Oh, ouch, <laughs> why?" So here's the thing that's really interesting: when movies bomb like this, which I it was a bomb. Uh, it's a dumpster fire. It's always interesting to me when this movie's what two years, three years old now, and the director uh, David Ayer, 
is kind of like still kind of talking about some of like the behind the scenes things and things that could have happened. Almost like he's trying to like defend like what the movie could have been, but it didn't end up. Apparently there was supposed to be something where Joker's original scheme was supposed to be like, he was going to try to get into an alliance with the enchantress and they were going to kind of like team up because the Joker's character, you know, that was played by Jared Leto kind of felt almost out of place to me in this movie. Like it kind of felt like he was shoehorned in and there wasn't a lot of real reason for him to be there necessarily. Um, and we, we see him in some places and he's, you know, just, I don't know. It just wasn't there, but basically he was supposed to kind of get together with Enchantress. Um, they were also going to show him like trying to get together with Harley a little bit more and like pleading with her to leave the squad and come back to Gotham with him and just some other kind of some other stuff like, you know, with, with kind of how he treats Harley and whatnot that was going to be a little, a little different that maybe would have painted her character a little more sympathetic, you know, is going to show him being a little more abusive of her. And so you'd be a little more sympathetic to her, but none of that stuff happened, right? None of it, none of it really, you know, got past the cutting room floor. And so we don't get to see, you know, what David Ayer saying, like the growth and development of the Joker. But here's the thing. There's still going to be a Joker and Harley Quinn movie coming up, uh, along with a Joker film, a Harley film, the Gotham City Sirens, and a sequel to Suicide Squad. Now, if I'm counting along, we're talking one, two, three, four, five movies that are essentially going to branch off, kind of, off of Suicide Squad. Um, why, is my question. Because all the pieces of Suicide Squad were good, but its composition as a movie is what was bad. Um, do you know the, the story of the director and the, the recutting and everything? Not, not fully. I, I know that. So there was a, the, the director had a version that was more, more serious and, in and, uh, more traditional movie sequence. And then right. when the reviews came in for Dawn of Justice, just savaging that movie for being depressing and dark the studio freaked out and said no we need to make this we need to make this fun we need to make it wacky we need to make it crazy and they got the company that did the trailer for suicide squad to do a final edit of the movie suicide squad oh yeah so you have a trailer company editing a feature film and surprisingly enough it came out sloppy so I definitely understand the director sticking up for what the movie could have been because whether or not his version was going to be good, uh, that's not the version that was seen. That was not the version that bombed. That makes sense, I guess, to a, to a degree. I mean, maybe why he's still kind of, you know, hawking his his take on what it should have been or how it could have been. Yeah, because the the DCEU is so frustrating because every one of their movies, aside from Wonder Woman, which is just good, uh, there were good, enticing parts of it, and they were different from the enjoyable but very formulaic Marvel movies. But right. they just haven't gotten them right. Well, I was I think I was telling this to my wife, Brita, about uh, Justice League. She hasn't seen it. I purchased it. I actually own it because I saw it in the theater and my expectations for that movie were so low. I don't think they could have been much lower, to be honest. Um, and I came away being fairly surprised by how much I liked the film. Now, there was big problems with the film. There were some definite issues. But overall, I think because the bar was so low that there was a lot of parts that did work that I ended up enjoying it. And not, so I bought it so I could rewatch it, you know, a, a time or two and see kind of if it still holds up, if I still feel the same way. Um, but I mean, nothing, nothing that the DCEU done has been anywhere close to wonder woman. And I'm kind of feeling like that was maybe just a, a, a lucky flash in the pan because 
nothing nothing seems to be catching and nothing's hitting on all cylinders right nothing's really like capturing audiences the way that the marvel movies even though the marvel movies are formulaic they're enjoyable like black panther black panther is an, an enjoyable movie it's very 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 formulaic to the way marvel does movies but like we just said it's the number one superhero movie domestically in the u.s yeah i i just i say there's been enough good parts in all of the dceu films that i'm willing to give them five more chances whatever however many more chances it's like uh (sighs) it's like being a cubs fan you think that it's always always next year next year this 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 year they're gonna get it think then you know maybe the harley quinn movie maybe the joker and harley movie maybe the gotham city sirens i read about the gotham city sirens and the cast of it sounded really good i can't remember who it was yeah nice i i I read the casting too and this was a while back and i thought the casting sounded pretty good but i i'm just kind of at this point where the dceu where it's like i need i need it to do more I i need it to start hitting right and if that means they have to kind of take a page out of the marvel book and get kind of bash some for you know kind of doing some kind of copycatting if it at least means they start putting out some decent quality movies that you know aren't plagued by the way that some of these movies have been plagued uh with issues with directors and editing and you know trailer companies getting involved i'm okay with that like i'd rather I'd rather say, hey, it feels a little Marvel formulaic, but at least it's, you know, Superman or Wonder Woman or Batman or Joker or, you know, Green Lantern, whatever it's going to be, Flash. At least if it's a good movie. I, I don't wanna I don't wanna see bad movies in the DCEU anymore. Because the more they do that, they hurt their brand. They hurt those characters. And those characters are some amazing characters. Well well let's see. I, I felt like the Justice League movie was uh, they put the Avengers in an old copy machine and cranked out a imperfect copy. But yeah. you know what? I enjoyed it. It yeah, I I did too. I just wish I wish they wouldn't be doing. I wish they weren't doing it backwards, where we have the team up movie and then we're gonna go back and do all the origin stories. They needed to do the origin stories so we cared about those characters a little bit more. Um, I, I didn't care about Aquaman or Cyborg at all. I liked the Flash well enough, but that also may be my personal bias because I watched the Flash television show and I really like that show. Well, I mean, you got good source material. You got $200 million a pop to make these things. You figure they got to get it right eventually. <sighs> I hope so. <laughs> Uh, that's all I've got for, uh, Rebel Intelligence. Peter, did you have anything else? Nope, that was it. Well, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, last week, uh, we had a conversation. Josh was on the podcast, my brother, and we were talking about the video game movie curse. Is it a real thing? Is it not a real thing? Because there hasn't been a lot of great video games, uh, that have been adapted into movies. And... The question of the week was, what video game or video game franchise would you like to see adapted into a movie? And, uh, you know, Peter, usually we start over on the email, and usually you write in, and I've got your response here, but I figure you're with me, so tell me, Peter, what what video game franchise or, or video game would you like to see translated into a well, movie. Hold on, I'm going to read my email because I took the trouble to write it. <laughs> said, now everybody can hear it, my own words and my own voice. Dear nerds, go for R.E. It. Stephen Hawking, I was also going to mention his appearance on The Simpsons. I will second the recommendation for the podcast Reply All. I don't believe in the video game curse. I just think there's a difference between the kind of story that sets up actions a player can take versus a narrative that you are led through. Trying to make a movie out of a game's story is doomed to failure. Creating new stories in the world or with the characters from a game has potential. Basically all the things you and Josh said. My game playing experience is decades out of date now, so I'm missing a lot, but I would love to see a movie set in the Legend of Zelda world. Happy uh, most recent episode number, Peter Christensen. 69, dude! Uh, 
I'm I I like I like what you said there, Peter, and I did have it up when you read it. Uh, I like what you said about well agreeing with us first of all. That was nice, but uh, <laughs> about a movie set kind of in a video game world, but not necessarily tied to the video game story. So doing something kind of extra, you know, it's giving something else for the characters to do, you know, something different. Because I personally think that's the way they need to go if they want to make it, you know, something that is going to bring in other audiences that they don't need to rely on. You know, here's the beats from the video game that we have to hit, right? So I actually liked the Warcraft movie, but the first time I watched it, I had not an earthly clue what was happening because I didn't play the games. I didn't know the character names. I didn't know the place names. Uh, it, oh, it was so confusing but it looked cool and you know, the orcs looked great and all this. And after watching it a couple of times and I learned the places and people, then I was okay with the story, but they were trying to make a movie out of one of the game stories. And it was just too much for a new audience. Hmm. They had taken, I haven't seen that. If yet. they had taken, you know, one half to two thirds of the material they tried to cover and made a movie out of that it would have been much more legible for a first timer. But the movie that they made was only really enjoyable on first viewing for longtime Warcraft fans. I played world of Warcraft for a number of years. I also played Warcraft three for a while. Um, I loved both of those games. I didn't see the movie only because I kind of feel like I've stepped out of that world for so long now. Uh, Would you recommend watching that though? I mean, would you say it's a good enough movie? I'd, I'd see it with Movie Pass. You'd see it with Movie Pass. <laughs> touche, sir. <laughs> touche. <laughs> no, like it's it's one of the most beautiful movies visually that I've seen in a while. And ironically, the orc characters are so they're such good actors, and they're portrayed as so like emotive and lifelike. The human characters are pretty flat and dull. Like, if you were an alien and you came to Earth and watched this movie, you would assume that we were a planet full of orcs acting in the movie, and they had low-quality CGI humans. Really? I mean, they still look like humans, but (laughs) they were just so much less effective characters than the orcs, who were, I think, some of the best CG characters outside of Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. Interesting. Well, I I think I think I've got it on Amazon Prime that I can watch it on. Give it a shot. So I may I may have to queue that up and and watch that maybe this weekend. So it's probably one I'm gonna have to watch when my wife is already asleep because I don't think she's gonna want to watch it with me. Um, but you know, that's uh, I'll, I'll watch it. I'll movie past that. <laughs> uh, okay, let's go over to Facebook. We got Paul Calicote. He says, okay. So my wife immediately said Bioshock and then God of War. I would like to see Titanfall, Gears of War, or Marvel vs. Capcom. Um, you know, by the Bioshock games, Bioshock Infinite, I think could be a crazy, crazy good movie. Um, the story in that is really good, and I think you could... I think you could tell that story without having to go through all of the the necessary fighting that's kind of in that game and some of that aspect of it and still kind of tell it because that's that's a pretty cool story. I mean, you've got time travel and you've got alternate realities and you've got just a lot of cool stuff that you could kind of touch on there. So I like that answer, Paul. I like that. Um, Jason Both on Facebook says, I always liked Street Fighter, the Legend of Chun-Li movie. I know it's not the best video game movie, but it's one of my guilty pleasures. I think video games should be done in more of a long-term TV series or Netflix or Amazon Prime. This way, creators can have more freedom to keep true to the game story. I'm not a big gamer, but I would have to say Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. I think this should be done in a live-action TV series... That way the story doesn't feel forced. I have found that these games were fun to play and it would be a great asset to the Star Wars universe. Uh, Jason's a good friend of mine. I've known him most of my life. 
But I've got to say, that's probably the most perfect answer that I can think of as Star Wars The Old Republic, uh, Knights of the Old Republic. That was such a good game and done right. Even if it was like animated, kind of like Star Wars Rebels, um, I think I think that storyline could be adapted and be really cool. But I do agree with them. It has to be it has to be something that's a, a TV format, not not a movie. That you couldn't do that mo- you couldn't do that story in two hours. So I will say for whoever voted for the Legend of Chun Li, uh, there's a comedy site called Cracked, and they write some pretty funny stuff. One of my favorite articles yeah. ever is called Seven Seven Baffling Moments from the Worst Video Game Movie Ever," and it starts out. The Legend of Chun-Li isn't just a movie. It's proof of the second law of thermodynamics. Everything can always get worse, even the Street Fighter movie franchise. (laughs) I recommend looking up and reading this article. It's hilarious. Nice. I'll I'll definitely have to do that. Um, Let's go over here. Uh, Again, Facebook. Eric Gifford, my brother-in-law, says... "Uh, he wants to see only the terrible video games should be made because it would only serve to destroy a story of good franchise if history in this area continues. Keep away from the Legend of Zelda. So he's going to go the other. He's going to go the other way and say, "Don't do the Legend of Zelda because if you destroy it, you're going to you know ruin the franchise and you know be sought in its good name." Sounds like a man who believes in a curse. Sounds like it. And, uh, you know, I don't know, how how well would a Legend of Zelda game be adapted? Oh, I don't want an adapted game. I want a movie set in that world. In that world. Would, I mean, would you still have the, the all the characters? I mean, you have Link, have Zelda, have Ganon. Sure. You can have, you can have some type of quest that is not one of the ones from the games, because that would be too long for a movie. Right, you could have a hundred hour movie you could do the uh do the uh optimistic first movie where it's the movie is going through the first dungeon and then seeing off in the distance they're finding some clue that there's seven more dungeons and setting up a franchise that way that could be interesting or make it a TV show of course it <laughs> that's probably be the better way to go because I try to remember there was a movie. Oh, I think it was maybe I Am Number 4. My wife and I were talking about that. There was that movie, and there was also, uh, was it Jumper with uh, Hayden Christensen? Oh, yeah. Where, where like, they kind of set this thing up, and, like, they set it up so, like, you definitely know there's going to be a sequel because there's a whole lot of unanswered stuff from the movie. They drop all the breadcrumbs, kind of do the J.J. Abrams thing. And then the movie was horrible, and it didn't do well, and, of course, you never get a follow-up, so... You know, those little breadcrumbs just kind of go nowhere. My favorite one of those was the movie Lawnmower Man. It ended with a great setup for a sequel, but the movie did not do well. And so I think it got a direct-to-video sequel a few years later, but it was very optimistic about its chances of success. Right. And you have to be careful, I think, with that, right? I mean, dropping like little subtle Easter eggs or little things, but... If you're like, you know, to be continued, like imagine if Back to the Future had said to be continued and then Back to the Future 2 never happened. Like, talk about like a freaking tease. That would suck. Uh, Going over to Twitter, uh, Mike BC at Mike BC 1985 says The Last of Us. I think that's obvious. I, I'm with you there, Mike. Yeah, it says also Quantum Break was great with the TV episode as cut scenes, but I'd like to see that as a full movie or mini series. Uh, I never played the quantum break games just because it was on Xbox and I don't have one, but I heard a lot of people really liked it. So, okay, make it happen. I- I'm down with that. Uh, animation fan at D spin six, seven says, I want to see uncharted. I know there's been talks, not sure where they're in, in on getting this to the screen. I think God of War would be a good one to bring to the big screen if done right. No live action, only animation, but done by a top studio. Uh, I'm down with the Uncharted. Like I said, Uncharted to me has a very Indiana Jones feel to it. Um, so I, I think something like that could really definitely work. 
Uh, God of War would be really kind of cool with Kratos going all over the place, but I like the idea of action. Uh, or uh, the action being uh, animation versus like live action. I think that's the way you'd have to go with it. But uh, Super Friends, thank you so much for answering our question of the week. We we appreciate the interaction. Uh, once again, we will always uh, ask a question and put it out to all the same places. You can always reach us on Twitter at Ford of Nerd or Facebook, which is facebook.com slash Ford of Nerd. Or by email, which is the way Peter gets a hold of me every week at fortofnerd at gmail.com. Or the phone number, which is 801-477-7687. Go ahead and leave me a voicemail, and uh, that may just find its way onto the podcast. How often do people, uh, call, Peter, how how often do people call into the voicemail line? Uh, you know, it's been a little while since it's happened, but it kind of is sporadic because we maybe get one or two every so often, and then we'll get like five or six all at the same time. Maybe I'll call in this week so, instead of emailing. <laughs> there you go. So it's once again 801 477 7687. Peter, how can the Super Friends help us out this week? Uh, you can help us out by rating the Fortress of Nerditude on iTunes so that the Fortress of Nerditude is not as difficult to find as a voicemail in Spencer's inbox. <laughs> very, very well done. Very well done. I like that. Uh, let me ask you a question, Peter. Uh, growing up, were you a big Steven Spielberg fan? Uh, yes. Who wasn't? Right? I mean, how could you get through the 80s without seeing some some of Steven Spielberg's movies, if not all of them, right? I mean, you got the big stuff like Jaws and E.T., and then you've got, you know, other stuff that he, you know, was kind of a part of, like Jurassic Park. Um, you know, he helped do the TV show ER in the like early nineties. I mean, he's, he's done, you know, Indiana Jones movies with George Lucas. I mean, just everything, right? Book, Minority Report, Catch Me If You Can. Right. Just a lot of great, great movies. I love Steven Spielberg. I, I think I've, I think I've seen almost everything he's ever done. Um, and, and for me also for a long time, he was a big inspiration because he was an Eagle Scout. He, you know, was a big supporter of the Boy Scouts. He got his Eagle and he always talked about that being really influential on his life. And I earned my Eagle. And so like, I I kind of also wanted to be a filmmaker for a long time in high school and getting into college. I kind of entertained this idea of going to, to film school at USC and becoming a director and, you know, being in the movie business. Um, that's not exactly how my life worked out, but I love Steven Spielberg. Now, that being said, something kind of happened just recently this last week. And he, Steven Spielberg made, I was in an interview and he made a, a comment that he says basically that he thinks anything that's on Netflix is television. And it should be treated as such, and that nothing that comes from, let's say, Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime, any of the any of the streaming services, should not be considered for an Oscar because they're television or they're a TV movie. And he was kind of pressed about that a little bit, and he says, he says, I don't believe that films that are just given the token qualifications in a couple of theaters for less than a week should qualify for the Academy Award nominations. Um, Let me ask you a question. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about him saying, first of all, that he doesn't think stuff on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon should qualify for for an Oscar, that it it should be treated as TV? On the surface, do you agree with him or do you not agree with him? I do not agree. Uh, I'm certainly not going to say that. I know more about the art or business of movies than Steven Spielberg, but uh, a movie's a movie. And if it's, you know, an hour and a half to two and a half hours long and characters go through an arc and it's got high production values, I mean, that's a movie. I don't, I don't have a more clear argument than that. So it's interesting and and we'll get to this in here in a second cuz i want i want to kind of dig into this what's interesting to me is that one of his justifications he also says for this is that he thinks that by treating these as you know 
movies for the Academy Awards that basically what happens is that the bigger movie studios now will not take risks by making smaller or like weirder original movies that they're going to instead just kind of go with the big tent pole, you know, popcorn, summer big box office hits. And he says that a lot of the smaller films that studios used to make routinely are now going to Amazon, Hulu, and Netflix. So I, I kind of feel like part of this is maybe kind of the old way of looking at it. And then maybe also a little bit of it's kind of defensive, it seems like, because maybe we know that Hulu and, you know, Amazon and Netflix are becoming are becoming more of a force in Hollywood. I mean, what was it? Just uh, Manchester by the Sea, I think, won with the Best Academy, uh, the Best Picture Award of the Academy just like a little over a year ago. And that was an Amazon Prime movie. And, you know, we're seeing more of these things be nominated. Those mid-sized movies have been gone for 10 or 15 years now. Um, Structurally... The movie business has about the same number of theaters, but there's a bigger, much bigger audience worldwide. So the number of movies getting made hasn't changed a lot, but the size of the market has. So you're going to see more big movies and fewer middle movies because you're competing. Same number of movies are competing for a bigger pie. And then small movies can go to um, film festivals. So there's lots of great movies that are $5 million and under, and lots of great movies that are $100 million and above. But like a $40 million romantic comedy or character drama, that that's going to go to TV. Because it's right. not going to justify being on screens when the next franchise superhero or Star Wars movie could be up there. Right. So I, I looked it up to see kind of like what what the eligibility requirements are for getting a picture uh, nominated for, for the Academy Awards because he was kind of saying that, you know, token qualifications. And so here's, here's the qualifications. First of all, a feature-length movie is considered any movie over 40 minutes. So anything under 40 minutes is going to be a, a short, something like mm. that. So it has to, has to be 40 minutes or over. 40 minutes. Has to, be, has to be publicly exhibited by a means of 35 millimeter or 70 millimeter film or in a 24 by four, or 48 frame progressive scan digital cinema format. So basically it needs to be something with a minimum resolution of like tw- uh, 2048 by, you know, 2048 by 1080 pixels, right? So that's, you know, 35 millimeter, 70 millimeter, you know, or it's got to be digital, but it has to meet, you know, certain requirements. So it can't be something shot on an iPhone. Uh, currently, you know, they make it up there. Um, the audio has to be typically a 5.1 or 7.1 channel surround sound discrete audio. Or if it's a non mono configuration, the audio has to have at least three channels left, center, and right. Um, it has to have four paid admission for a commercial motion picture theater in Los Angeles County. So basically you have to pay admission at a commercial theater in Los Angeles County. It has to have a qualified run of at least seven consecutive days during which period screenings must occur at least three times a day. And one screening has to be from six to 10 PM daily. So it has to run in Los Angeles County in a theater for seven days. It has to show at least three times a day. And one of them has to be between six and 10 they also have to advertise and they exploit the movie during their Los Angeles County qualifying run in a manner normal and customary to theatrical feature distribution practices. And it has to be released within the awards year deadline, which is, you know, January 1 to December 31st. Um, basically, then it says that if it's first broadcast on TV, cable television, pay-per-view, video on demand, DVD, or internet transmission, it is ineligible. And he says that basically what happens is there's a stipulation that says if the movie runs on its first day in the Los Angeles uh, County qualifying, uh, like if if it's the the first day there and then on the second day, it's also released to internet transmission, DVD, whatever else, uh, like Netflix, Hulu, um, 
uh, Amazon Prime, that as long as it was first, the first day was in a, uh, a Los Angeles County theater, it's okay. Like that still counts. So, and then of course it has all, have to have all the normal stuff like full screen credits and da 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 da, all the kind of the, the normal stuff. If there's any disputes, the Academy will figure that out. Um, if it, if it, uh, if it was the motion picture first was theatrically released inside the U.S., uh, prior to Los Angeles County, it'll still qualify as long as whatever, like, so if it's in festivals, right? Like if it goes to Sundance or there's screenings, um, as long as, as long as it makes it to Los Angeles County and nothing's changed, it's good. As long as it hasn't um, gone on or the if it, Or, right. Um, or if it was outside of the U.S., before it's a Los Angeles County qualifying run, uh, it still can be submitted as long as it takes place in all the commercial motion pictures, blah, 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 blah. Um, and as long as no non-theatrical public exhibition or distribution. So any of the ways we kind of talked about. Um, and then just some other stuff on screen credits and, and whatnot. Here's the other thing. You can only have one Los Angeles County qualifying run, and the earliest run is the one that'll count. So like, let's say they show a movie for seven days and then they go back and they redo a whole bunch of stuff and then they run it again. The first one qual is going to be the qualifying one. So any changes that'll happen. So I guess what's happening to me, the, what, what it sounds like this is happening. And maybe this is where Steven Spielberg's kind of coming in is that it sounds like what's happening is these, you know, movies that are like Manchester by the sea, right? So this would have had to have, had a run in Los Angeles County for seven days. But what they could have done is they could have put it up and the first day it's only available in, you know, the one theater or, you know, the three theaters or however many they put it in, just a handful. And then on day two of their seven day run, they also release it on Amazon Prime, which is where most people would go out and watch it because it's, they're really intending to run on Amazon Prime. They're only going to run it for seven days in Los Angeles County. Right. In a theater, I remember Netflix just did to that. qualify. Netflix did that for a movie with Idris Elba, like a Beast of No Nation, or uh, some some award bait movie about children growing up in an African war zone or something. Uh, and it was in one screen in suburban Los Angeles for a week, just so that right. it would qualify for Oscar uh, nomination. Um, I think it's interesting after you read those rules that there's those rules fall into two categories. Basically, it has to be a movie of a certain length and quality, and then a bunch of finicky rules about when and how it's released. And right. in my mind, the first part, the rules about it being movie length and high quality, high production value, are a hundred times more important than was it released in Los Angeles County for a week? So I'm not part of the Academy. I don't get to make those rules. And if I thought those rules were important, then these internet, uh, movie companies, uh, skirting the rules this way would be annoying. But I think that the, those rules are far less important to the art of movies. And I think, if the Oscars wants to to die on this hill about being shown in theaters as opposed to um, being visible to people, uh, I think they're just going to be seen as more out of touch with the kind of movies people want to watch and do watch. So what's interesting to me about this is that, you know, this is obviously Steven Spielberg that's, you know, banging the drum about this issue right now, at least right now. I mean, We'll we'll see if you know if this gains traction. If other directors get involved, you know, if like the Directors Guild, you know, gets into this, or if it, you know, SAG in general gets you know into it, um, if it becomes a bigger thing, or if this is just you know one one very well respected director, obviously, um, kind of banging a drum and you know getting up on a soapbox and you know kind of talking about you know talking about something that he disagrees with, and I and I get it, you know. The Netflix, Hulu, uh, you know, streaming services, you know, all that, um, the Prime, it's it's it, it's a threat to, to the traditional movie theater experience. Um, we've seen a huge shift in, you know, how people watch things. Like we talked about, Gone with the Wind, right? Back in the day, 
you had the choice of listening to a radio program or actually going and seeing a moving picture show. And you were going to choose to go see Gone with the Wind because it was fantastic and was new and you were going to see things you've never seen before. Now, you know, we've had, you know, the VCR and the ability to now watch movies in our home and then DVDs and now we can just stream it and we don't even have to like go anywhere to go get the movie to bring it home to watch it at home. We can just pay a rental fee and bang, it's right there. Um, so things are shifting and I, and I get that. But I guess that if it really comes down to it, you know, these movies maybe just do the the token bare minimum they need to to qualify. But I, I mean, if it's a good enough movie to qualify for an Oscar and to be voted on by the Academy, that means that it's a quality product to begin with. And and I think that's probably the most important thing, right? Right. I mean, the Emoji movie was in a lot of screens in Los Angeles County before it got to Netflix. But I don't right. think that's the relevant part of the Emoji Movies <clears throat> Oscar contention. I would love if uh, we had a third host on here that was deep into knowledge of the movie business. Because I know that Netflix is spending between like 5 and $7 billion a year on content. And Amazon is, I believe, over a billion dollars a year. And Apple's looking to spend over a billion dollars a year. And I don't know how much Hulu spends. But you're looking at... 10 plus billion dollars worth of content budgets from those uh internet movie companies how much are the traditional movie theaters like paramount yeah. and sony what? how much are they put pumping out uh, especially if you take disney and family out of that budget total like this is right. going to be this is where the money to produce movie content is going to go to because it's just a way it's a way better business model for customers because they can pay the cost of one movie ticket to get access to tons of stuff. But because most households in America are going to subscribe to Netflix and be Amazon prime members, that means the amount of money going in is astonishingly huge. And I think it's going to be good for movie theaters because it's the competition that you need to thrive. The stuff that you can get for free or for included in your Amazon prime membership or for $10 a month from Netflix is really, really, really good. And movies have to be better. And I think that some of the movies that have come out in the last five years are some of the best movies I've ever seen from the, the new yeah. star Wars movies, uh, Moana, uh, hidden figures. They're all just, they're so good. And even though there's more good TV than there ever has been, I've had more fun going to the movies in the last five years than I have in a long time. Probably since I was a kid seeing Batman and Terminator 2 and stuff. I, I, I'm i looking at this issue, I mean, and I'm with you. I mean, we we have so much good content that's uh, that's coming out now because there's so many different people getting involved, right? Because, I mean, you still got all the movie production companies that are there, but... You, you've got the Hulus and the Netflixes and the Amazon Primes, and I know Disney is now getting ready to, you know, gear up and have their own service. And, uh, you know, you even have like TV stations like CBS who are doing the, CB all, the CBS All Access, right? So if you want to watch the CBS stuff, you know, they're all the video on demand, the streaming, like we, we have so much good content out there. And so it just, I just wonder. Well, the production companies are wonder, doing great because. They're the ones that Netflix is paying to make content. Yeah, ab absolutely. So I wonder, I wonder if Steven Spielberg is just upset because he feels like maybe, maybe, you know, movies that go the traditional route, you know, are going to get edged out of competition or that they're going to have more competition for the awards. Um, and so here's, here's my thing. If that's what he's worried about or other directors or other people in the Academy, Change the rules. I mean, the rules can be amended. It's, you know, not like, you know, it's not like that, that can't be changed. Change it so that, you know, that it has to have a seven day run, but you can't concurrently be streaming it anywhere, you know, after the first day. So it's got to run for a full seven days or make it run for a full two weeks or, or something like that. So you could change the rules, but I, I, I think, 
I think I'm on I think I'm on a different path than Steven on this issue where I, I think if it's a a good quality movie and if it meets, you know, the technical requirements that the academy wants and then they meet the other little, you know, you've got to run it in Los Angeles County for 7 days and at least one day has to be non-concurrent blah blah blah. If it's a quality product, it's a quality product. Like there's so much good stuff out there. Why would we not why would we not want to have uh some of these things be nominated and be recognized for the contributions in the directing or the acting or, you know, or the screenplay or the, you know, costumes and whatnot. Like, yeah, the, it's just as good. It's just as high quality. The question is, do the Oscars need the top movies more than the top movies need the Oscars? And I don't know if the Oscars wants to press that question and find out. That's a good question. I mean, because the big movie directors are still making movies, but 10 years from now, are they going to be making like, I wonder who the first huge director that's going to make a movie for Netflix as opposed to, uh, theaters is going to be. And, you know, how many dominoes will fall? I, I think it's going to happen faster than people think. And it's going to be to the point where if the Oscars don't include, uh, streaming internet funded movies, they're going to be like the NIT basketball tournament where it used to be prestigious, but now it's a joke compared to the NCAA tournament. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a real good question. Who, who do you think is going to be the first big director that's going to jump? I, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be some of the directors that maybe are big names, but maybe not necessarily. I think that some of these small directors that Disney and Marvel and Star Wars have tapped to make their movies in their well-defined systems, uh, I think they're going to be the ones to go on because they don't have tons of movie experience, but they did make a super successful movie. So they can't, yeah, they okay. can't necessarily punch their ticket like Steven Spielberg can, but getting the director of the last Jedi to direct your Netflix movie would be a big deal or sure. getting Taika Waititi to do your movie after making Thor Ragnarok. That'd be a big get. And I think that's probably where it's going to come from first. I wonder if like Quentin Tarantino would do something like that for Netflix. Cause to me, that sounds like something he may, he may do. I don't know. I think he's like a film purist. I think I, uh, I think I've heard that. That may be true. Um, you're talking about the the missing mid-sized movies that just aren't in theaters now. Um, I just watched a movie on Netflix called When We First Met, and it's like a, it's like Groundhog Day meets Big meets romantic comedy, and it was cute. It was funny. It's got uh, Adam Devine, who's been in uh, the Pitch Perfect movies and stuff. Uh, it yeah. had no big stars. It had a budget of $10 million. There's no way that movie would have been released in theaters today. But it's on Netflix, and they put it on their front screen for a while, and it was fun, and I enjoyed it. And if those uh, you know, 10 to $50 million budget movies are on Netflix, that's great. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I mean, you look at certain stuff like Stranger Things, right? Stranger Things, I love that show. Would that show be made on on TV in today's climate? Mm, I, 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 maybe. I doubt it. I mean, maybe. broadcast TV or cable? Broadcast TV. No, but cable TV has been driving prestige television for at least since The Sopranos. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, you've got, you got a lot of, you got a lot of different things that have been, been on there, but I mean, like if it, if it went to sci-fi, like if that show was on sci-fi, it would not have done anywhere near as big a business as it did on Netflix because more people watch Netflix than they do the sci-fi channel. Um, but I, I, I don't think broadcast TV, I mean, like you look at CBS, 
CBS has got a, another TV show with Kevin James. Kevin James has been in like one version or another of uh, the same sitcom for probably what the last decade, the last fifteen years on CBS. Yeah. And you know, it's you know they kind of stick with what what they know. You know, Big Bang Theory. Like I used to really love the Big Bang Theory. Now I still kind of watch it, but I you know I don't find it as funny as I used to. But I mean, they're sticking with shows like that. Um, I don't think you're going to see some of the the risks that like a Netflix or an Amazon Prime or a Hulu can take. But I think the install base on on some of these streaming services is so big that if something does catch on like Stranger Things did, everyone talks about it. Everyone talks about it, and they have access to, you know binge watching it so they can watch all eight, eight episodes or all 10 episodes or whatever they're going to show, you know, for the, for the for the season. And you don't have to do the week to week to week to week wait. Yeah. My rules for watching a new TV show are number one, it has to be done and off the air because I'm not going to wait week to week. And number two, the people that are fans of it have to be so annoying that they won't shut up about it. <laughs> so by that by those yeah. rules i watched breaking bad which was great and i did not watch lost because people would say things like yeah it's so good and then it didn't end well or it got annoying or oh it trailed off after a while and like okay that's not a show that i'm gonna do that sh- that show was so good. It was so good the first few seasons and it did trail off it got good at the end again but it uh, yeah, I could, I could talk about that for a whole episode. I loved that show and it just, it didn't, it wasn't strong all the way through. And so I, I get that, right? Because a big show, especially if you're going to binge watch something, that's an investment of your time. But I think that these broadcast TV shows, they're doing something different from prestige television or streaming funded stuff. Uh, their job is to give you, it's, it's to be like a McDonald's hamburger. McDonald's hamburgers aren't great, but you know exactly what you're going to get when you order one. It's exactly yeah. the same. No matter where you're like, at. B minus C plus anywhere in the world, any time of day, any time of year. And if you're watching two and a half men or law and order or, uh, NCIS or any of these things, you're watching it because you want to feel like you're watching it. You want the experience of that show. Versus Stranger Things is like a big movie that you're going to be super into and then not have it for another year. Right. And I think that the, yeah, uh, yeah, the yeah. broadcast TV shows, they're kind of like uh, the newspaper business where it's still a big business that makes a lot of money, but there's no growth prospects in it. Like the number of people that watch Two and a Half Men is so many times higher than the number that watch Game of Thrones. But you hear a hundred times more about Game of Thrones because it's exciting and it's more, yeah, it's more interesting. It, it's not formulaic. It's not, you know, you, like you said, you know what you're going to get with the two and a half men TV show. You don't know what's going to happen with those dang dragons on Game of Thrones. Right, nobody's go rushing into work to say, you know what happened in the latest episode of Big Bang Theory? Exactly the same thing that's been <laughs> happening for the last 200 episodes. <laughs> right, right. Ex- exactly. Exactly. It's just different, different, uh, products. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this question, and Peter, and this will be the question of the week for for the super friends uh, out there. Steven Spielberg obviously is not a big fan of the Hulu, you know, streaming, Netflix, all the VOD stuff for the movies, uh, for the Oscars, you know, for the award season stuff. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, in, we're living in a new, a new environment. So my question is, do you prefer watching, stuff in the movie theater or on television, or do you prefer watching it on a streaming service uh, like Netflix or Amazon prime? I I love watching movies in the theater. Um, There's so much good stuff that I watch on my five and a half inch phone streaming it. Um, What I would love is if movie theaters had more flexibility to show old showings of classic movies, or if you could, if like Netflix would rent out a theater and have an all day marathon where you could watch stranger things on a movie screen, uh, or, you know, go back and watch 
you know, the first Mission Impossible movie again, or something besides whatever the newest movies that are coming out. I think that would be great. I don't know how well it would work as a business. I think it would be hard to advertise and get audiences for. But I like movies. I like TV. It's a great time to be entertained. So you're looking, you're looking kind of a hybrid, a best of both worlds there. I mean, can you imagine watching Stranger Things on a 70 foot screen? Dude, it'd be awesome. <laughs> it, would, it would, it would be freaking awesome. Uh, you know, I, I look at this question and while as much as I love all the streaming stuff and it's some great content, there is something to be said for going to a movie theater and having that experience of seeing it on the big screen. And being there in the in the dark, and ideally everyone's kind of quiet around you, and there's not you know a bunch of distractions and kids and phones ringing and you know people coming and ringing the doorbell and interrupting you every ten minutes. Um, there's something about being in that theater and you know having that experience. And so for me, that's my preferred method to see some of the big stuff. Like I don't I don't want to wait for the next you know Star Wars movie to come to the streaming service and watch it. And that's not knocking anyone that does, but if, if I can get out to the theater, I, I want to go see it in the theater. I, I want to get the, the experience that it was actually designed for, which is a part of the reason why I got the movie pass this year, because I wanted to get out more and get to see more movies. And I figured I could, you know, get my money's worth and then some. So, so that's kind of where I'm at. Like I, I want to see it in the way it was designed to be. However, in your scenario, though, you know, if we could stream, you know, older movies, you know, like Ghostbusters, I would go back to the theater and watch the original Ghostbusters again if they were to stream it, you know, whether it was for just a weekend or something, because I love that movie or, you know, stuff off Netflix, you know, the Stranger Things, stuff like that. Like I I would go pay to, to go see that in a theater because I think that would be a great experience and it would be something different than, you know, just being home or watching it, you know, on my phone in bed, you know, while... While I'm supposed to be sleeping or something. I feel like it shouldn't be that hard to make a platform where you say, I want to watch Willow on a movie in a movie theater. And if we get this much pledged, then we'll get a screen at, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning on a Thursday. And we can watch Willow on a big screen. Like a Kickstarter kind of for which movies we can see. Yeah, it seems like it wouldn't be that hard because... You know, especially midday or early showings of they're not crowded. It couldn't be that expensive to rent a screen. And I don't know what it costs to get the rights to stream a movie, an old movie. Or it seems it seems so doable. And, you know, if if anybody (laughs) if any Fortress of Nerditude fans have connections to the film industry, and want to talk more about this, I would love to talk to somebody who could maybe make it happen. Uh, I just, I bring the right. ideas, you bring the products. Uh, or a voting system, like maybe we have two choices, right? Like you can go there and either you're going to get to watch Jaws, depending on how everyone votes, or you're going to get to watch Tootsie. <laughs> and, you know, two classic movies and really good in their own respects for various different reasons. And you vote, and whatever the voting percentage ends up being of the people in the theater, that's the one you get to watch. <laughs> and and either way, you're going to have to be okay with that because you went there knowing you could be one or the other. Or like a theater could set aside one showing a week as the fan fan chosen, and there's you know six movies that they set aside that you can get the rights to, or that they could get the rights to show, and whatever one gets the most votes or pre-sales, that's what they pick, and then they can market it. There's... There's got to be a way to make it work. Knowing my luck, it would all be Ben Affleck movies or Fast and Furious movies. So I don't, I don't know, I don't know how I feel about this now that I'm thinking Come about on, you it. You know, you would love to see Gigli on the big screen again. Oh no, no! Daredevil, anyway, Super Friends, that Dogma. My oh gosh, yeah. My 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 qu- my question is. Do you do you prefer to see movies in the theater or television on on the TV, or do you want to get your entertainment through the streaming services—Netflix, Hulu, you know, Amazon Prime, 
the upcoming Disney, whatever, whatever's out there. Uh, let me know all the usual places, uh, facebook.com slash Ford of Nerd, Twitter at Ford of Nerd, email Ford of Nerd at gmail.com or the phone number 801-477-7687. Peter, thank you for coming back on the show and being a uh, guest host with me this week. It's been a lot of fun. It's my pleasure. I'm available anytime. Well, I will keep that in mind. Uh, where can the super friends find you out there on the, uh, the old social media? Eh, I'm not super social on media. Just listen to the fortress of nerditude. You'll hear my thoughts every week. <laughs> there we go. I like that. A, a plug back for the show. Sounds good to me. Well, super friends, wherever you may be, may the force be with you always. <laughs>